16 countries all have the same head of state. This is not an elected leader, but the head of the House of Windsor, Elizabeth II. Now, as you could imagine, being the leader of so many countries would be a lot of work, and so she, like the kings and queens before her, delegates her regal duties to a citizen of the country. These people are the Governors General, and are the Queen or King's Viceroy, inheriting the power of the monarch in their absence. But we are past the days of yore when kings and queens micromanage their kingdoms, and so what are the official duties of the Governor General in the modern world? We are used to seeing our Governor General attend important events and give speeches and present awards, all the while living in a big fancy house. That is, of course, unless the monarch decides to pay a visit. So what are the official duties of the Governor General when it comes to running a nation? First, how does one become a Governor General? The short answer is, the monarch makes you one. The long answer, shortened as much as possible, is you need to first, be a person of relative significance to Canadian society, second, be connected enough politically to be noticed by the Prime Minister but not too political as to be controversial, and three, be recommended by the Prime Minister to the monarch to be made the Viceroy, serving at his or her majesty's pleasure, which conventionally is a five-year term. This format has been in place since the 1950s. Before then, the monarch would appoint someone from a noble house or the British aristocracy. As the monarch's viceroy, the governor general is technically the head of state. Now, you don't typically hear about them much in the news, because countries like Canada are autonomous nations, with the real decision making and day to day governing being done by the elected and appointed representatives of the citizens, your members of parliament, and from them the cabinet ministers and prime minister, and the appointed senators. In the decision making process, the governor general provides the royal assent, which is the final approval from the crown for a parliament to pass legislation. However, this is more of a symbolic gesture and a rubber stamp of approval, as the last time a king went against the wishes of Parliament in the UK was 1707, and it has never happened in Canadian history. The Governor General can also exercise the royal prerogative, which includes such actions as declaring war, ratifying international treaties, and issuing passports. But I will say that if the Governor General or the Monarch were to do many of these things without the backing of the government, it would be a rather messy PR disaster. Now where you have probably heard about the Governor General has been around election time, and where things can get a bit more interesting. The Governor General ensures that there is a stable government and acts as a safeguard against the abuse of power. At election time, the Prime Minister goes to the Governor General and asks for Parliament to be dissolved, triggering an election. This is known as dropping the writ. Normally this task is done with little kerfuffle, but there has been cases where the Governor General has chosen otherwise. This happened in 1926 when Prime Minister William Leon Mackenzie King had his request to dissolve Parliament denied by the Governor General Lord Bing in the King Bing Affair, or the King Bing Wingding thing. This event was a constitutional crisis for Canada and even redefined the role of the Governor General in future decisions. The Governor General is also the one who appoints the Prime Minister and ensures that the Prime Minister can hold on to the confidence of the House. This is a relatively simple question in a majority scenario, as the leader of the leading party will almost certainly have the necessary 50 or more percent support in a confidence vote. If for whatever reason a confidence motion is lost, the government is expected to resign, the writ dropped, and an election called. This is far more likely in a minority government, as the party holding a plurality of seats requires the support of the members of other parties. If while forming a government the leading party is unable to acquire enough support, the Governor General can turn to the next leading party and ask them if they have enough support to form government, instead of simply calling another election immediately. This hasn't happened at the federal level in Canada, but we came close in 2008 when the Liberals, New Democrats and Bloc Québécois formed a loose coalition and requested that they be allowed to form the next government, should a confidence vote be lost. The Conservatives, under the leadership of Stephen Harper, requested that the Governor General prorogue Parliament, ending the current session instead of allowing a budget vote to be held, effectively giving everyone a cooling off period. During the prorogation, the Conservatives acquired the necessary support from the Liberals to gain the confidence of the House. I've been talking about the Governor General and the federal government so far, but now I'd like to turn to the Lieutenant Governors. These are the monarch's representatives in the provinces and have the same duties as the Governor General, but for the provincial governments. The Governor General is appointed by the monarch on the advice of the Prime Minister, and the Lieutenant Governors are appointed by the Governor General again under the advice of the Prime Minister, but this time with input from the respective Premier. Even though they are appointed by the Governor General, the Lieutenant Governors are direct representatives of the monarch, bringing the total up to 11 vice regals in Canada. The territories have a similar position of commissioner, but their powers are derived from the federal government, and not the monarch directly. With 10 provinces, there have been a much larger variety of scenarios that have played out. In Ontario in 1985, the Lieutenant Governor John Black Aird exercised the royal prerogative and, when the Progressive Conservative Party lost a confidence motion after only 55 days in office, the Liberals and New Democrats were asked to form a coalition government. 
As of the making of this video, there is a similar situation brewing in British Columbia, after the 2017 provincial election resulted in a plurality for the Liberal Party, with 43 of the 87 seats in the province, and the remaining seats being split by the New Democrats and the Greens. If the Liberals are not able to hold the confidence of the legislature, the Lieutenant Governor could ask the New Democrats or the Greens to form a government. This could be an unstable situation, as the Speaker of the House would still have to be chosen and could result in a natural tie of votes and an impartiality convention of the Speaker entering into the spotlight. But that could be a whole other video entirely. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm Tom, and this is all about A.